Welcome to Conscious Profits Unfiltered. This is your host, Sebastian Nam. What up, guys? You know, I feel like one of the things that people perceive to be the hardest to monetize is creativity. You may be thinking, that's not true. Creativity is heavily monetized, and that is, in fact, the truth. But when it comes to being an artist or becoming an artist, it may seem like one of the hardest careers to go after. Have you noticed how badass and beautiful street art and wall murals have become over the past decade? Have you actually noticed the difference that a sick-ass mural makes to a particular street? Especially if that street or wall was a dump before, and now it's filled with creativity that inspires. Well, this beautification process of rough streets and boring walls has been blowing up. Today, I've got the authors of that movement, Evan Mayer and Ruben Rojas. Evan, the founder of a highly successful SaaS company, and Ruben with a finance background. Both artists who were able to use their business knowledge and scaling abilities to turn this hobby of making quote unquote ugly walls beautiful and run a successful nonprofit and for profit called Beautify Earth, which is responsible for painting murals for over 60 different brands in over 80 cities worldwide for more than 100 local NGOs with over 10,000 murals. That is a crazy number. Hang out with Evan, Ruben, and myself and listen to not just their story of how they got to where they are today and how a side hustle and passion can become a worldwide movement, but also to why we should even be paying attention to this beautification process in the first place. Enjoy the show. What's up, guys? Welcome to the show. How's it going? It's going hey. good. How you doing? Right on, guys. Right on. I'm excited. We're going to talk about some cool shit today. We're going to talk about... Art, we're going to talk about scaling art internationally. We're going to talk about bureaucracies, issues with cities. We're going to talk about making money with art. It's going to be a good time. But first, I always like to ask my guests. I'm going to start with Ruben. Ruben, when was your last oh shit moment? Uh, When my dog Tuesday came over to me with a little hanky that said, I'm going to be a dad. Oh, that's awesome i love that yeah that's amazing amazing congrats ivan when was your last hell yeah moment oh man i had an oh shit moment i I know i got you there you You got me oh shit give us the oh shit anyway i was making chicken broth and i realized i had a I take I, I mash the bones in my chicken broth, and then it's it's a little bit of a thing. And then I had to strain it, and I put it in a pot, but the pot was a little soapy. It wasn't rinsed well, so I had a, I, the chicken broth didn't work out. Dude, that sucks. It would have been. That is <laughs> yeah. called self cleaning chicken broth, Evan. For a man of efficiency, you drink it, and your teeth are already brushed and clean. Oh, there we it was go. Perfect. It's yeah, probably it was really good. good for your gut health. That's With right. palm olive, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, guys. Well, I'm excited to get going into it, into art and talking about beautify and everything. But you know, I, I gotta say that I've heard that you guys have cried on each other's shoulders before. You've shared a bed together. So give us a little bit of the the good stuff, a little bit of background on that. We should we should just get right into the goods, huh? Let's get right into it. Who's the fork and who's the spoon? <laughs> Ruben's got a few pounds on me, so. I think he likes to be the uh, the big spoon. Or the it works egg. better. So yeah. Efficiency of mattress space. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We had to share. We had to share a mattress uh, a couple times. Um, one time it was smaller than other than another time. Um, uh, one time was in a uh, workshop that we took together, and we had a little bit of an outing, and there was a shortage of beds, and we said. Screw it, we'll share it, and that was a twin size bed, if I recall correctly. Right, that was a that was a twin. That was snuggy. Oh yeah, very good. Ruben's a great sleeper, though. I will say he's not an aggressive sleeper. Doesn't snore. You know, I mean, really, really doesn't swing his arms or anything. It was really pleasant. Um, and then the second time, we were uh, Ruben. Why don't you tell the second time? The second time we were in this charming little town in Clarksdale, called Clarksdale in Mississippi. And we stayed at this really cool place called the Shack Up Inn, which basically is a plot of muddy dirt, literally, because there's planks you have to walk off or you kind of fall into the mud pit. And it was just tin 
and we slept in there. And it's because our other buddy was with us, but he's six four and got even more pounds on both of us. So sharing a bed with him was really not the move. So he we sleeps. were in Clarksville, Mississippi. He sleeps with his arms. I can't really do it in this view, but his arms are his <laughs> legs wide, wide angle. He, I remember him saying, like, no, we can't do it because he takes up the whole bed with his arms and legs spread open. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So clearly you guys have become close over the years. You've become close friends. Um, and outside of all the joking around, it you know, I think um, – Clearly, you guys have been vulnerable about each uh, around each other. And outside of having to share a bed, I know you guys have become close friends and you've shared vulnerability. How important do you guys feel that having shared vulnerability between business partners can be um, in a partnership? It's important because when I don't call Evan back, he tells me and lets me know instead of holding it against me and vice versa. We tell each other things. And we have no problem doing it. I think that's the most important thing because we've we've had other people and we've worked with other people. And sometimes you just hold it in and it's either Evan and I talking to each other about other things because we can't talk to that person about it. So I think it's it's good. It's healthy. That's great. It is healthy. I mean, it's it's good to be able to communicate all that. It just allows for just to, to get into the next thing. And now I have to worry about holding grudges or anything weird going on you know, allows you to focus on the business and, and focus on, on your mission. Yeah. So um, at what point, uh, Evan, did you guys realize that the friendship could turn into, uh, you know, business partners or was it kind of the other way around where like the idea started flowing about the business and then the, the, the friendship grew? No, well, I think it sort of started together. There was a, there was a passionate moment around the mission that, that um, when we met that sort of, uh, created the sort of future engagement very naturally. So I think they sort of grew together. Um, we became missionaries together um, while our friendship grew. Please share um, that. Uh, the mission yeah. was uh, or is to end ugly wall syndrome uh, and to uh, eliminate the world's ugliness or uh, in our urban environments or even suburban environments. Um, and um, by using art as a way to create color and inspiration instead of bland, boring, blighted facades that we have to experience every day. And we realize the power of inspiration and the mm. power of color and the power that art has, um, and it should be understood universally. Um, art's always got taken a back seat, and now we're exposing that through um through what we do i love that i love that and let's why don't we talk about that very first project which was beautify lincoln and for anyone listening that needs that context so lincoln boulevard is actually a, a little chunk of pch which is pacific coast highway and pacific coast highway basically runs all the way up and down northern and like all the way up and down the coast of california gorgeous and Lincoln Boulevard, that chunk runs through Venice, California. And like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, Venice was pretty rough to say the least and still is in, in some ways. And it's crazy because you got some rough streets around like multi-million dollar homes. So it's a little bit of an anomaly. But Lincoln was, you know, for lack of a better word, pretty ugly. So what was Beautify Lincoln? How did that start? Which was the seed that basically planted for, you know, international uh, scale. So what was that about? Yeah, um, that was, well, let's see. I was part of my neighborhood association at the time uh, called the Ocean Park Association. And I always like to say that, just a little plug for community and lo local orgs and neighborhood associations, get involved and join a neighborhood association if you have a feeling about something you want to change or something you want to do. It all starts local. It all starts at your neighborhood mm -hmm. level. So I always say, quit complaining about federal politics, start getting involved in local, um, mm. in local activism and make a difference. It's change you can make. And it actually started there where I was part of um, uh, this, uh, our neighborhood association here in Santa Monica. And there was a, this, this, this stinking link, it was called stinking Lincoln is what everyone was referring to it as. And there was a lot of politics around who the city owned it, the state owned it, and how they're going to get money and make it better and all the ways of improvement. And I should say, other than 
I think some bus lane changes and some street pavements, not much has been done in the last 10 years mm -hmm. other than the dozens of murals that we started doing there uh, that have now transformed pockets of Lincoln. It's super, super cool to see. And, um, and it runs through Santa Monica and Venice. And uh, during this time, uh, other little um, neighbor, uh, other Beautify projects took off. This was about eight or nine years ago. And other little name, Beautify Crenshaw took off, and we had Beautify Rockaways in, in Brooklyn, all these little, you know, bringing people together to make a difference. And at the same time, uh, Ruben and I were doing this thing together, and um, and we realized there's an opportunity to turn this into a global, a real global movement together. Uh, and uh, we formed a nonprofit uh, called Beautify Earth, and uh, we uh, have been plowing the ugly fields of walls ever since. And that is... And just to tell anyone out there exactly what it is that you guys do, like just specifically, like you paint murals and like electrical boxes and things like you basically make them badass, right? Like what what do you guys do on these, on these ugly walls? And ugly yeah, streets? so basically you've seen beige and gray and it's taking over the world and it looks like prisons, right? It's like, where's nature? Where's it look like? You put a little bit of color, even if it's as simple as blue triangles or red circles or yellow circles, it doesn't matter. Or epic masterpieces. And what you start realizing is people start feeling better. They take more responsibility and they look at something that's actually a work of art. There's a, just a huge difference. So it's simply the, the before and after is really what the powerful thing is. Yeah. Um, people sometimes think, well, I'm not an artist or I'm not this, or I can't do that. Paint the whole thing pink, right? There's a very famous building in West Hollywood on Melrose. And just that makes a difference. So it doesn't have to be like a photorealistic portrait of a person. Yeah. It could right. be simply as an amazing, bright, perfect color. So, and that's it. It just makes everything completely different. I love that. And I know, Evan, you just touched on it just before, but in it, it's not just the visual aspects of the obvious of making something beautiful. It does a lot more than that, right? It That's does right. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about that. Why, why do you think it inspires? How does it change the vibe of the neighborhood of the street? Sure. Well, I'll start with just carrying forth with what Ruben was saying. I think it's a good segue into what you're asking, which is, the difference is intention. Hmm. The difference is something that feels and looks like it was cared for versus something that looks and feels like there was tagging there and you covered it up with blotchy paint. Like, what do people look at? Like, when you look at that wall, what do you think? Oh, that had tagging on it. Now it looks like two tones of uneven beige, different tones of beige. Like, that, it, looked, it probably looked better with the tagging. I'd almost rather see writing on the wall sometimes than the way that they cover it up. It's so bad because at least it's authentic. Yeah. The covering up is just like you're hiding someone's expression. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the, the difference is intention. And what happens when you put forth that intention is most of these problems, I won't say all of them, but up to 95% of the tagging starts to go away because people are not interested in destroying art. Mm. Some people do, and that's really me. Okay, but it does, it reduces it by like what we've seen and not just us, but even academically and research that's been done and through many, you know, arts organizations, even San Francisco started giving money to landlords who got tagged a lot because they realize it's a better investment than covering mm. up graffiti. Um, so that's okay. another one of the byproducts. So it's the way you feel. And this all starts with the way you feel when something is ugly. Um, and I, I want to use that word carefully because that could sometimes be um, right. subjective. When, it's, when it is unintentionally neglected or intentionally neglected or an unintentional wall space with intentional neglect, you feel that. I love and that. That's the difference. So like Ruben said, it could be a pink wall. It could be a triangle. It could be simple, tasteful design, but it's showing that you took the time to even think about it. It could be cheap and it could be just a little bit of thought. That's all it takes.
I love that, man. So it's the intention and essentially it changes the energetics. It changes the energy that it gives out, which helps create a different energy around that street, around that neighborhood and inspires. I love it. It creates a cared for space and people start caring yeah. for the space, reduced litter, reduced loitering and vandalism and it, everything, increased foot traffic. People come to see the art. It's an economic play. It's one of the best things you could do for the economics of a small street like is to bring art and culture to it and expose that to the world. I love it, man. That's awesome. So can you just reach out to cities and just try to get stuff done? It sounds so complicated. It sounds bureaucratic. You know what I mean? Like what, like, can you give, if you had to give, you've obviously had to jump through a lot of hoops. Are there any tips you can give to someone that's trying to do stuff with the city that you'd be like, dude, just go, go at it this way. And it'll actually save you some time. I, I want to answer this in, in one way, and it's complimenting Evan. You've got to be tenacious, and you got to not take no for an answer. Like, Evan's been plowing through Santa Monica for years. I and mean, even now, it's still, if it wasn't for our love for what we're doing, it's kind of one-sided. Like, mm. that party's going to get all the benefits, but do it for the benefit of what you're trying to accomplish. Don't worry about what the city cares about or the politics or this, you're going to have to swallow your pride and, and ego in many cases, but just be s strong on your mission moving forward. Love but that. aside from tips. So keep that mission yeah. and be tenacious. Yeah. For the sake of, and, and for the sake of clarity, I, I, the relationship with the city of Santa Monica has been wonderful for, for many years. And yeah. It's, it's difficult to get things done in general and sometimes through cities when you have an idea and you want to push it forth. I have been so grateful for the relationships and, and the support of the city and the different neighborhood groups. We have built some like it's truly all of these 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 local organizations and the city that have come together for some amazing projects. But um, but like Ruben says, yeah, it does take tenacity um, you may be the only one or of a few people who absolutely see in a small city the power that art had or that murals have or right to make this kind of transfer from um, transformation to do it on private walls and private buildings. It's another thing. So, you know, it's, it's really about building community, working together with the local with with the different groups. And 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 yeah, it's sort of it's not much different than any form of entrepreneurship. Not everyone sees what you see immediately. Hmm. You have to sometimes educate and enroll and get people to to bring people on board to get them to understand. And well, no matter what the vision is, that's what building uh, a mission is. That's what building a business is. It's what building it, whatever it is you're doing, right? Amen. Everyone's and, priorities and, are different. And to and, add to that, there isn't like one right door you knock on. Like we've done murals with almost every department in multiple cities. You would think it's arts and cultural affairs or this or that, but no, mm. it's like public works or trash or the uh, police department or the neighborhood association. You never know yep. who you're going to be working with That's or right. other local nonprofits that are boosting small business like uh, biz, business uh, improvement districts, right? The PIO on Pico things like that. Main Street has a bid too. So there's different bids in different cities and different communities that you can also be working with to help move all of this forward. That's super interesting and a great point because it translates to just about everything else. You're trying to work with big corporations or big companies and you think that you got to reach yeah, this C-level executive or this manager or this title or this one. And maybe they like five different people say no, but just keep knocking on the door from different yeah. side doors. Somebody says yes and, and you get to it, you know, and that's don't That's, take no for an answer. If it's absolutely. a good natured thing, you believe in it in your heart and you know, you know, not everyone has the same priorities as you. And um, so that's that's really the tip is yeah. uh, expect that most people are going to say no. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be welcoming that and learning each time they say no about why and getting yeah. smarter in your approach. Um, it's learning. Yeah. Absolutely. With anything in business. Yeah. So Ruben, you were in finance and you were doing this as a side project. You used to draw. You weren't like you're were like you knew you were an artist, but you weren't like it wasn't necessarily like a part of who you were as like, hey, I can do. At what point did you see it and like, hey, this can be a career like I can make money doing this shit. I can, I can make money making art. And I think that that's a really important thing, too, because 
art is one of those things that seems kind of fairy taley, like, oh yeah, like not like, you know, like five people can make money do you know, doing art. Like mm -hmm. when did that hit you? And what was that like? What was that feeling like? Hey guys, I just want to remind you, if you want to find more content like this, you can visit SebastianNaum.com. That's Sebastian, N-A-U-M.com. You can also get a ton of other marketing resources for myself and my agencies, ranging from SEO to social media, influencer marketing, branding, web development, and more. Again, that's SebastianNaum.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the show. Well, it didn't happen right away. I mean, I painted the first one, second one, the third one, and I still worked full time for three years. I was doing both. Three years. And for three years before I finally said, you know what, I'm not going to the office anymore. And part of it is you have to bet on yourself, but you've got to be smart. And anyone that asks, like, how do I be, turn my side hustle into something? You got to make sure enough is coming in to keep you afloat mm. so that when you do quit, you're not running back to the safety net. Like, oh, rent's due. I got to go get back a job. So realizing that. So I was testing out how can I make money doing art? Whether it was my art or not, it didn't matter. Can I bring in a project? Can it feed me? And doing that several times over and over, now you can replicate something. So in finance, I had a formula, 10, 3, 1. 10 meetings, three of them keep, one becomes a client. So I knew that every time I had 10 meetings on the books, I would keep three of those appointments and one would become a client so I could start counting on income. There was no formula to art. There's nothing I could put like that, but I was starting to see, well, how can I bring in projects that paid me something, whether I did the art or hired someone to do the art or project managed or yada, yada, yada. So it's just, it was a little bit of a balancing act and yeah. then continually to bet on myself and then realizing all of this became something. I didn't know from day one that this was where I was going to be. I had no idea. But I always say Evan's the one that made me paint my first mural. So he's the he's the founding member of Ruben. Um, <laughs> but well, also what with the platform and with Beautify, it's what's been really difficult is in artists and we and I'm only speaking from experience is artists are very focused on one thing and they have tunnel vision. And they don't realize that if you start working with other organizations, giving up pieces of things to help sell your work, you're actually moving forward and moving ahead. So one of the beauties about what we're doing here is we're creating this marketplace to allow artists to put up their resumes for free, to go look for walls for free. And if you get a project, you get paid. And yes, Beautify takes a piece of that. We got to keep the lights on. We got to continue developing. But now if you get a big chunk of something from a project that wasn't there, maybe you do two, three, four a year, there's income now you can start counting on. That's actually a little bit of a formula. It's not 10, three, one, but once a month, go try to get a project. Maybe you land one on top of everything else that you're doing. Right. So just realizing that partnering with people and collaborating with people is going to get you to move forward and move ahead because we can't do everything on our own. I yeah, shouldn't do it on my own. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think bringing up the aspect of the side hustle, you know, I wanted to actually bring that same thing up uh, to Evan. And because I know, Evan, you have you had you know, you had a you're involved in a very successful uh, SaaS company called Right Amigos, which I know you're still partly involved with, but at the time it was, you know, your main thing, it was your baby and you're fully committed to that. So how do you manage, how important was the side hustle, which was beautify also like Ruben's side hustle when that side hustle also has a lot of passion involved. Right. And you really care about that mission. How do you, how do you manage that? Yeah. Um, Good question. Um, yeah, Ride Amigos is also my baby. I love, I love the company. I love the mission. I love the people. The team is amazing. That was one of the hardest things is like, I love these people. Like, uh, you know, it was, it was, a, it was emotional. It's a relationship in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I managed it is I never really parted with it. Like I parted with it day to day, but I never like, I'm still like, you know, feel like I'm part of the company. Mm -hmm. I just don't day to day. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm at this point probably close, you know, closest considered as an advisor um, to the company. Uh, and after, geez, I guess 
12 years, 13 years almost since I started it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. It's always a piece of you. Like, and you know, these are people who have become friends of mine. Like this, this, this is a, this is a family. Um, Bride Amigos is a family. I, th I, I think something that's, you know, important that I'm getting, sorry to interrupt you, that I'm getting from, you know, both you guys is like, look, at the end of the day, there's a lot of schools of thoughts that people say you need to focus 100% of your energy on one thing. Um, and then there's that idea of like, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket and, you know, have a bunch of different things. And like, obviously that can get, you could spread yourself too thin, but I'm a big believer in the side hustle and that side hustle can become your main hustle. And when it becomes your main hustle, it doesn't necessarily mean that your other main hustle that you had before right. is dead or goes away. It could also then now that main hustle becomes another one of your side hustles. And so if you can learn how to manage that and, and find great team members, like you were saying, Evan, and count on people. And, and, and that's a way too, to, to also diversify yourself, um, your skill sets to keep life exciting. And also, hey, like at different times, you know, in life too, like some things won't do as well as others. And it also helps too, in terms of like, obviously your, your personal economics, but more so than anything is, the idea to have been able to pursue like a different missions and, and passions, which is, which is, I think pretty awesome. So guys, where's beautify earth at today? It's scaled a ton. How many cities are you in, in the world? And also it started, it started as a nonprofit, but you guys created a for-profit branch. So what's the dynamic there? Uh, um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll give the stats first. Um, uh, to date we have been able to place, uh, through um, um, uh, hand curated murals, local policy and organization working uh, to help build and train uh, lo other local organizations. We have now placed over 10,000 uh, murals. That's epic. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, we're, and, and a lot of that, most of that was all done really well. For Ruben and I, it's been, we haven't made a dollar yet, from from anything with beautify in the last decade um other than if someone pays us to do uh our own art because we're both artists obviously so you know if, if, if i get hired as an artist um you know then sometimes i get hired on, as an artist our profiles are on are on beautify um but uh we've worked with hundreds of local ngos uh and and uh, municipalities we've and we uh and other local orgs and we have uh, worked with over 50 national brands to date. Wow. Yeah, like some awesome campaigns around community, lead, you know, local leadership and communities and community leaders and um, to, to supporting, you know, uh, home, uh, ending homelessness with recently with the people's concern. Um, and uh, to, um, there's just all of these different causes that you can identify, basically that have been promoted as part of these uh, sponsored campaigns, uh, which is really, really special. Um, so in basically in seeing all of the success through the non, through the work of the nonprofit, we realized it's time we ease the pain of the logistics and the execution, a lot of the laborious work that goes into it, negotiating and planning and figuring all this stuff out. And we need to build a technology platform that is going to help this mission continue to thrive faster than ever. So we are one family. Uh, usually it starts the other way around where you have a for-profit that then creates a non-profit for whatever reason they decide. We came with heart, soul, passion, and volunteerism first for almost a decade and then realized in order to take this thing to the next level and leverage the power of capitalism and economics and really incentivize people in the right way to see the economic value of art. And that is what we are so focused on now is we are creating and finally showing the real value that has just not been able, this is why like schools can't get funding for art easily, right? It's the, always the first thing to go. And arguably one of the most important things you can have in your life emotionally, creatively, and it's always the first thing to go. And it's because people are not able to quantify that value and we are finally becoming able to do that. That's, that's awesome. So it's how important is it to bring 
those aspects from when you created the poor for, uh, for profit side of the business and bringing traditional business aspects into the nonprofit in order to make it scale, right? The operations and the technology, like you said, I mean, it's key, right? To bring that aspect in, to make it, to bring the good things of capitalism, right? The, the benevolent aspect of capitalism into it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I I think I the I, I'm not clear exactly on the question. Can you? No, yeah, so well, again or yeah, yeah. It actually, it sounded more like a statement. It was. Oh, I thought it was a statement. That's why. <laughs> okay. Okay. It was more like a statement, but yeah, I guess I, like are there certain aspects or like certain aspects of the operations of the for profit that make it easier to scale? Like, are there specific aspects of like what a traditional business had that made it easier for this bit? For this to now scale and get to so you know fifty thousand murals in so many cities and worldwide. Yeah, yeah. So the way I would answer that is just telling you how a mural comes to fruition, right? The timeline could be anywhere from a month to a year, and it started with door knocking. Hey, do you want a mural? Your wall's ugly. Hey, do you you know just like Ooh. old school real estate canvassing? Then you go from there, and then you you go back and forth on. They, they finally say yes. Then you go back and forth on an artist. Then you go back and forth on design. Then you go back and forth on money. Then you go back and forth on supplies, insurance, and all that. Then you go back and like, that is a lot of time, conversations, emails, and talking to people. And how many of those can you actually do? Maybe 10 a month if, if you're an efficient person. So what the technology does is removes all the back and forth because now it's just in the platform. So essentially you could be doing a hundred now versus 10. So it took a lot of that out. There's still yeah. all that conversation to get to that point, but it's just streamlined now. You could have one person project managing a whole bunch of projects where before it was so hands-on that one project manager actively had maybe four projects. Yeah. And the tool's not, it doesn't have to be just used for murals. It can be used for any sort of minor infrastructure -y creative project yeah. that community wants to do or someone wants to get done. Cities can use it to manage these projects, um, organize, you know, local orgs and, and even big corporations can be using this to manage. So there's, you know, we're, um, they have it all in one place. They don't need to go to multiple uh, uh, parties to do all of the things they would have normally done. One vendor, we handle everything. All the contracting, the insurance, the payments, just we make, we take all that liability off of HR departments. We are the, um, yeah, we're for cities in general. We just did another one where they manage like a dozen projects right off the bat through uh, uh, of the K-Rails project here in Santa Monica that we did. It was like, that would have taken months. And we basically, between starting it through the front and, uh, and ending it through Beautify, it was a matter of weeks. That's and awesome. It would have normally taken like six months or something, I, something like that. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with that aspect of bringing, you know, traditional business aspects into like a nonprofit or a give back uh, in order to scale it. And you could just make such such more of a difference. And also, you know, it also helps make more money, which helps make more, more of a difference, which is essentially what this podcast is all about right in a sense and so one of my you know missions in a way when um you know you think about the concept of giving back and doing good and like conscious quote unquote capitalism and things like that you know you know when we're growing up uh you know the the idea of like giving back or volunteering or doing nice shit was like kind of nerdy you know if you think about it and this is not going to go across the board for anybody for everybody that's listening but you know you grow up and it's not like the coolest kid in school was the one volunteering and doing purpose-driven things you know what i mean and if they were a lot of the times they were probably hiding it again there's exceptions to it but that wasn't the thing so part of my mission is kind of like you know showing that this this shit is really cool actually and you could actually make a, a lot of money doing it and money equals freedom and the more money you can make and the more freedom you can have the more of a difference you can make and you can actually scale good. So I know you guys resonate with that. And in a little bit of a different manner, you guys, um, how is it that you're like, part of your mission is also showing some, you know, big time companies, quote unquote, boring companies, maybe that some badass art can really make shit cool and actually help business as well. Yeah. So uh, being in service, that's it. It's the greatest reward 
because if you just do it, it feels good. And some of the Easter eggs at the end of that journey were all of a sudden like, here is an example. I did good and had a couple people help me paint a mural. One happens to be the head of X company that then says, hey, I wanna do 20 of these. And then something like that continues moving forward. So that's one example of things that have happened. But at the end of the day, all we wanted to do is like go out and paint an ugly wall, cool. And have some people take responsibility and feel really cool about it. And also these adults start feeling like children. And to go back to what you originally said, you know, I know I remember when I was growing up, the only give back stuff was like in church and religion. Mm. I don't remember it's becoming the culture. It's becoming like we start seeing a lot of companies are wanting to give back to the community. It's like there's a billboard and there's that marketing budget, but is it really speaking to who is in your neighborhood? Where are these corporate offices? What can they do in that immediate neighborhood? Not just advertise to the world or the masses. And it's just super rewarding. Take the money out of it, take the award, take everything out of it. When you're done, it just feels good. And that feels right. And that's all that matters. I love yeah, that. I think, I think the, like, there's nothing cooler than, than being part of the community that you're serving. Like that's the coolest, like, like working within the community, putting a box in a community and saying, buy our stuff and having a, just a, a planting your box there, your corporate box and, and thinking that everyone's like, oh, that's not cool. You're just being big in corporate. And, you know, I'm not, it's the way it is at the moment, but our, one of our missions is to help corporations integrate into, lo into local communities, use local artists, be, embrace the local values and the local cart cultures. Don't just plop your box on a, on a main street and think everything's cool. It's not cool. You're immediately gonna be like, uh oh, the big company is gonna come and drop their box in the middle of our little street. That's a problem. No one wants that. They take it because they have to, there is value there. They do provide product or service that's important, but, it's the feeling, right? Again, it's the intention. It's like, did you just plop your box in the middle of our main street? Or did you try to show that you're part of this community? And it doesn't take a lot, but it does take a little thinking about it and thoughtfulness. And that's cool. It's cool to relate to the people that you're trying to sell to. It's cool to get a feeling that it's not just about selling. It's about you actually caring about the people that you're selling to because the things that you're selling and the services you're providing are making their lives better and it's important for them to thrive and you really do care and if you don't it comes off that way mm -hmm. we want to help them tell that story and yeah. and and be authentic and and, and change the cultures in the organizations mm -hmm. so that they're thinking about not trying to be authentic how do we become authentic, but actually being authentically caring. Amen. It's awesome. I love that. And if we're going to add to that, let's add one more thing. It creates company culture, right? These companies are trying to create culture, are trying to create loyalty amongst their employees. How do you start nurturing that? Get engaged, get them engaged. And that starts adding to that culture of giving. And then they start realizing, oh, my company cares about me too not just the community mm -hmm. and getting them involved and activated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ruben, do you have a favorite mural that you've painted? You know, I get asked that a lot and they're kind of all have their own very special, unique story and share and stuff that goes with it. So they kind of all are. Evan would like me to say that it's rebirth, which is on the corner of ocean park and Maine because we did it together. <laughs> But I well. would say, I would say it's the default answer should automatically be the, be the first one I ever painted. But probably my my favorite ultimate when I look back just hasn't been painted yet. Okay, right on. Why not? Why not? So suspenseful. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Evan, you, there's a there's a guitar in your background. Were you trying to tell us you wanted to play something on the guitar? Or did you want to play something right now? I just, I'm just trying to like 
feel you right now. I don't know if that's what no. There's about. always a guitar in the background, uh, uh, <laughs> only because a music is a big part of my life. Okay. Uh, I um, well, feel but, free. Uh, oh, well, I have to. I realized. I realized to do this. I sort of have to take some time here and move things around. <laughs> um, I yeah. wasn't prepared. I, I realized I didn't prepare. Um, I could try, but next time we'll make you sing something. Yeah, I could probably do it. Uh, it just have to set it up. So maybe I, right I on, know. right on, guys. Can artists get in touch with you to become part of the team and make some money doing badass shit and ugly, boring walls in their own cities around the country, around the world? Because how does that work? Go to beautifyearth.com. Register as an artist, put a minimum of five completed murals up there and start trying right. to apply to, to walls and stuff. Obviously, you can email us as well. There's a ton of information on there. But the easiest first thing you should do is start your account, register your profile. It's mm -hmm. like the LinkedIn for artists. Nice. It's a, it's a little goal that we have. That's cool. That's really cool. Both of you guys are you know, great examples of conscious leaders. Um, Evan, what do you think are uh, two most important traits that a conscious leader has to embody today? Um, optimism mm. and I'm going to give three. Okay. I know you asked for two, but I'm okay. still going to give three. Please give it. Um, and I'm going to say optimism with 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 realism as your base, but pushing forth optimistically. Um, learning, being well, be, be, being able to see things objectively and take feedback often, and continually iterate on what on what you need to do to create your vision. Yeah. And third is empathy. Mm. Um, I mean, I could probably give six, but these are just the top three that right. communication. Wow. Uh, I could I could get into, but but empathy is so important, and I don't mean it in like the maybe I do. It, it, it became like a buzzword a little bit, right, right. But I know what you mean. Forget about the buzz stuff, right? For you to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and realize that there's yeah. many different perspectives in the world, and not everyone thinks like you do sort of like a step of becoming an adult too, right? You realize like, oh, not, but a lot of people forget that. They still haven't embraced that. People have different priorities. They think differently and you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes to understand what they need in order to see the value in what you're doing mm -hmm. or why they just don't need it and it's not for them and be able to swallow that and that's fine. Not everything is for everybody, but that's, so I'm going to go with, Optimistic realism, uh, learning relentlessly, and empathy. I love it. Ruben? I'll make it shorter since Evan took all that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Simon Sinek, let's take a page out of his book. Start with why. Why are you doing this? You can burn out at anything, no matter how much you love it. So mm -hmm. you got to have your why secure and strong. And it directs everything, your, your direction, your come from, keeps you empathetic, keeps you learning, keeps you optimistic. And then the other one is personal responsibility. Also falls into a few things that Evan said, but I always have to check myself as like, what did I not do here for you to not understand what I was trying to tell you? Instead of saying, you don't understand me, you did it wrong. That's not fair, right? Evan and I think completely different like way differently. Um, so we got it. That's part of our relationship on how moving that forward. So personal responsibility and know your why. I love that. That's awesome, guys. Well, uh, for anyone listening, you'll be able to check out the, the show notes and get all the links in there to follow Evan, follow Ruben and, and follow uh, Beautify Earth. And uh, if you're listening to the audio podcast and you still and you like this and you haven't subscribed, just just subscribe already. And uh, seriously, guys, Loved it. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome, conscious leaders. So just keep being you guys. Really appreciate you being on today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, Sebastian. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. <laughs>
Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. You know, it takes a lot to put these things together, but I truly love doing it. If you enjoyed this episode or the show in general and you listen to it on audio podcasts, please take some time to give it a review. It would really mean a lot to me. And if you watch the video, please go ahead and just click subscribe and share it with somebody that you think would like it. It would really mean the world to me and it helps keep the show alive. Visit SebastianNom.com for more content and follow me on Instagram at SebNom. That's S-E-B-N-A-U-M. Thanks again for spending your time with me. I know it is valuable. I hope you have a great rest of the day and week. Till next time.